weeks ago, as many of you will remember, it was my pleasure to visit the Huddersfield home of Mr and Mrs Kenneth Bygott. But as time caught up with us on that occasion, I've returned to have another chat with Kenneth. So, on behalf of your radio friends, old and new, welcome back, Kenneth. Thank you indeed, Frank. It's very pleasant to see you again and have a further chat with you. The part of your career as a cinema organist that we didn't get around to on the last occasion was as a broadcaster. And of course, that was what brought your name to a much wider public. Yes, most certainly. That part was a very exciting experience, I must say. In particular, my visits to the BBC Theatre Organ, the Compton at St George's Hall in London, and I had some very interesting and exciting moments there. Yes, I was going to come to that. It was a very large organ. Did you have any problems in coping with such an instrument when you normally played the comparatively small two-manual nine-unit Wurlitzer at Bournemouth? Yes, many problems indeed. If you press the wrong button with your foot or with your thumb, you could cancel the whole thing that you built up in your rehearsal and uh, the whole thing would sound unbalanced. What I did particularly appreciate on that instrument was the coupling to the grand piano which resided in the alcove, a matter of 30 feet away from the console itself. I used to enjoy getting the rhythmic effects with organ accompaniment and the piano solo in the right hand, so to speak. And you could add couplers which would give you the effect of playing with uh, many more hands than you had, actually. <laughs> you didn't broadcast during the time you were resident at the New Victoria Bradford, did you? No, I didn't, Frank. I hadn't actually started broadcasting there and didn't indeed start until I got down to Bournemouth. But I did return at a later date to do the very first broadcast from the New Victoria in Bradford. Uh, and this was a great thrill for me. But the majority of your broadcasts came from the Regent Bournemouth, all of them live, of course, and frequently with an audience, which meant that you had to play everything so accurately, didn't it? Yes, it did. It uh, meant quite a lot of rehearsal on my part. Uh, you had to be on your toes all the time, not only literally with your toes on the pedal board, but uh, <laughs> right on the top of your form. Now, Kenneth, you have something that very few organists of pre-war days possess, because just before we started talking, you produced the recordings of two broadcasts which you made in 1938, and I find this very fascinating, because in these days of tape recording there would be no problem, but in pre-war days everything had to be recorded in 78 RPM gramophone records, lasting around only four minutes a side, which means that a half-hour broadcast covers no less than eight sides, each one taking up where the last one left off. Exactly, Frank. Uh, I think we should explain uh, here to the listeners that although these look like normal gramophone records, they were actually aluminium discs with a black acetate coating in which the grooves were cut. And as the coating had to be fairly soft to allow for the cutting, they wore much more rapidly than ordinary records. So I'm afraid that after playing over the years, a lot of the grooves have practically worn away in places that more scratched than music. Well, while you were talking, I've been looking through the records and most of them do seem too badly worn to reproduce on the radio. But there is one side here which doesn't look too bad and I think it's worth a try. Uh, it starts part way through a selection from The Firefly, with the most famous tune from that film, The Donkey Serenade. So, let's hear what it sounds like. <laughs> Thank you. 
considering the type of record and the fact that it was made almost 40 years ago, I don't think that was too bad. Uh, <laughs> it was taken from a broadcast from the Wurlitz at the Regent Bournemouth, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Well, that was certainly a very happy memory, and we're most grateful to you, Kenneth, for allowing us to share it with you. Now, you started off in textiles, and then after 14 years as a cinema organist, you went back to textiles for another 34 years. So one might almost say that your organ days were a, a musical interlude in a life of industry. If you had to start your life over again, would you do it the same way? Quite frankly, I don't think I would have anything changed. I did find that the uh, musical career was very exacting indeed. And you were playing in a more or less strung up condition most of the time. It was an exciting experience, really, playing to millions of people, as indeed I was during broadcasts. Now, turning to the textiles, it was so totally different. One had to work harder manually, and of course mentally, but uh, nevertheless the change was tremendous. In the early stages, I literally changed from evening dress, white tie and tails, to virtually uh, an overall but I soon overcame the change, and now I don't regret it, nor do I regret the wonderful years connected with music. Of course, you've always maintained your interest in music, which is an important thing. And in this very room, there's a lovely grand piano, which I'm sure provides you with a great deal of pleasure. Yes, uh, I did. This was a wedding present from my father and mother, and something I've treasured all my life. It's an old Broadwood, and I think it has an extremely fine tone. I get tremendous pleasure from it, and I'm very happy to know that I've given much pleasure on it to the visitors who come to my house. And you were telling me that a recording made by you on the piano was recently broadcast in the Ascension Islands. Yes, this is correct. Uh, the son of a neighbour who has gone out there on behalf of the BBC, I believe it is, had a, a record made by his parents. And they asked me if I would like to add one or two tunes, and I did. Tunes from the 30s, which I believe people are enjoying now more than ever before. And how I agree with you. Well, with worldwide fame at last, Kenneth, may I thank you very much for once again talking to us and on behalf of everyone I wish Mrs. Bygut and yourself good health, happiness and pleasant memories. Thank you Frank indeed. It's been a great pleasure to see you and I reciprocate your good wishes. I would also like to say the same to Arnold. I think his closing remarks in the previous broadcast about him uh, paying sevenpence to sit in the back stalls and listen to the organ being broadcast at the New Victoria. I thought this was a wonderful touch of humility and, uh, well, it's one of those things that you experience, isn't it, in life, which helps to make life worth living. He had an objective in view and he attained it. What a thrill for him. I'd just like to remind our listeners that, uh, of course, we shan't have an audience in the studio next week because Audrey and I will be in Holland. And uh, we think it's very appropriate, with me being in Holland, that all the music that you'll hear in next week's programme should be played by yours truly on the beautiful standard Compton pipe organ in the Avro radio studios at Hilversum over there in Holland. So you're going to hear something entirely different next week as regards music. But of course, your messages will be there just the same. And Frank Hale will be along, of course, as usual. So till I see you next week in Holland 
Well, can I just say thanks to Barry Davenport for his work on the programme. Thanks for Peter for having me on the programme. And most of all, thanks to you, the radio listeners, for giving me the privilege of coming into your homes via your radio. Oh yes, and if you're living alone, can I say a special goodbye to you. As at six o'clock tonight, I'll be sailing, and I'm going to play sailing. Don't say goodbye, because I'll be with you next week, of course, at the usual time. And in the meantime, goodbye. <laughs>